Well, it's my pleasure to finish this year's conference um, with a talk which, as you can see, is focused on the collections at the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. As many of you know, I arrived at the Royal Pharmaceutical Society to this building in September 2002 as its keeper of museum collections. I didn't have a pharmacy or a medical history background, but a history degree, a master's in museum studies, and experience as a social history curator, and of course, a desire to learn. And quite scarily, 20 years later, I fully immersed myself in pharmacy history. I thought I'd use this session to tell you about the origin of some of the collections at the Pharmaceutical Society, their collectors, and the museum's collecting over the 180 years since it was founded in 1842, not at number one Lambeth High Street, as we can see here, but in this building, 17 Bloomsbury Square. It's not going to be a comprehensive account, but I'll endeavour to draw threads together that link to our conference theme and perhaps inspire you to think about different types of pharmacy material and collections. And I should say that the vast majority of the images that I'm using come from the Pharmaceutical Society. I haven't necessarily credited them on each slide. I'm going to talk a fair bit about the ceramics in the Pharmaceutical Society collection because it's an area that I've been interested in and working on since 2002. And in a collection of over 40,000 objects, I obviously can't cover all bases. The stories I'll tell about acquisitions, expertise and wider collecting could be told about any aspect of the collection, from medicines to mortars and photographs to prescriptions. And just to start also with something a little bit didactic so that I'm defining my terms. As I'm sure most of you know, museums add objects to their collections through a fairly small number of fairly standard methods. Today, always making decisions against an agreed collecting policy so that objects are acquired strategically with serious thought about their relevance to the museum and its ability to look after them for the long term. So the different ways that museums acquire objects come into these different headings, either donation, which is a gift with no money exchanging hands, but certainly today with a legal agreement to transfer ownership from the donor to the museum. And one example here is the penicillin culture vessels, which were donated from Norman Heatley with a little bit of help from BSHP. Another option is a bequest, which of course is a donation, but a different kind of donation. It's sometimes known about by museums in advance, but sometimes it comes as a complete surprise. Um, the example on my slide is the portrait of Thomas Hyde Hills by Do John Everett Millay, and Hyde Hills left that portrait to the Pharmaceutical Society in his will. We'll come back to that in a moment. Another way is purchase. So that's obviously objects that have been bought. There's an exchange of money, um, either bought from private individuals or at auction. Um, and it's very rare for museums today because the majority have either no or a very small acquisition budgets. And therefore, if you want to buy something, you have to look for a grant. But in the example I've given here of this display drug jar, um, it was bought by the Pharmaceutical Society. And again, we'll come back to that a little bit later. And finally, in terms of our sort of standard ways of things arriving in museums, we have loans. Today, they're always for short periods and for specific purposes. So it might be for a temporary exhibition, for example. Um, in the past, um, the oxymoron permanent loan um, was the bane of a curator's life, but I think those days are over. And the other thing that I wanted to do up front is um, reflect that, as in the example of the Pharmaceutical Society, there are always museum holdings that fall outside those usual acquisition methods particularly ones that don't start out as historical items or even as items intended to form part of a museum collection. So, so for the Pharmaceutical Society, as with many other learned or membership bodies, um, it's often centred around ceremonial silverware, around fixtures and fittings and around portraits of the great and good. So here we can see the council chamber at 17 Bloomsbury Square in 1892 and you can see that the portraits are there on the walls. They weren't acquired to be part of the museum's holdings. They were gradually accrued primarily as representations of past presidents and key figures. The most significant portraits still in the Pharmaceutical Society's collection and now very much part of the museum 
um, are shown here. So we've got Jacob Bell painted by Sir Edwin Landseer on the left, and we've got the portrait I showed you a minute ago of Thomas Hyde Hills by John Everett Millet on the right. And when I arrived, I was certainly surprised to see such big names in a very small portrait collection and a collection that predominantly features works by much lesser known artists. What's also interesting, um, if you're into art history, is that both um, portraits are quite impressionistic of their treatment of their sitters. Well, that's, of course, is Millet's style, but the unfinished nature of the Landseer portrait of Jacob Bell is perhaps a bit more intriguing. It was described in a review of the portrait in the 1870s as good, but it has an unfinished look and seems to want going over once more to make a really fine picture. Well, as many of you may know, Bell's portrait has a poignant story attached, set in the last months of his life. As his health declined, he'd suffered from laryngeal phthisis or tuberculosis of the throat for many years, and in 1859 had moved to Tunbridge Wells for his health, although he traveled back to London regularly, for example, for pharmaceutical society council meetings. At one of those meetings on the 18th of May, 1859, the council requested that Jacob Bell sat for a portrait, and they said that it was in testimony of the society's appreciation of Mr. Bell's meritorious exertions on its behalf. Well, Bell must have taken this invitation on board and asked his friend, Edwin Landseer, They'd been friends. Uh, Bell had really worked as a Lancier's business manager and certainly as a patron and supplier of models to Lancier um, for at least 15 years. So he must have turned to Lancier and asked him to carry out this request. From Lancier's perspective, we know he wrote to his friend Billy Wells on the 9th of June, 1859. I wish you could see the sketch of him, meaning Bell, as large as life I did in one hour and a quarter which obviously goes to explain the rather sketchy nature of it. So it seems that Edwin Landseer travelled to Tunbridge Wells and that the portrait was painted at Summerhill House either on the 8th or the 9th of June 1859. And Bell died in Tunbridge Wells on the 12th of June, so just those few days later, aged only 49. Landseer presented the portrait to Thomas Hyde Hills with the inscription given to his very worthy successor, T. H. Hills, by his friend, the author. And then back to Thomas Hyde Hill. So Hills had joined John Bell's pharmacy business as a junior assistant in 1837, became the superintendent pharmacist in 1845, and he lived at Bell's Langham Place home um, for many years. Bell left him a significant proportion of his estate, including the pharmacy business, in his will. And after Bell's death, uh, Hills worked hard to continue Bell's interest in education and the art world, and kept up his contacts. In Hill's obituary in 1891, um, it remarked nearly all of Bell's art friendships were continued by his successor, who had already become closely connected with Landseer, to whom he acted as a business advisor and finally executor, with Millet, who painted a wonderful slapdash full-length portrait of his friend with, I believe, only one sitting. And to come back to our means of acquisition, in his will, Thomas Hyde Hill's The Queed Lancers portrait of Jacob Bell and his own by Millet to the Pharmaceutical Society, hence them now being part of the museum collection. So that very short anecdote, looking at just two of the paintings, um, already raises some themes for us of networks, of the interplay between private and museum collections, and of friendships. And we'll see more of all of those as we turn to other and parts of the collection. The vast majority of the Pharmaceutical Society's collection was acquired intentionally, and the title of my lecture, An Heirloom to be Handed Down, comes from a piece in the Pharmaceutical Journal written in 1842 by Jacob Bell. Bell was its first editor, as well as the man, of course, around whom the Pharmaceutical Society coalesced in 1841. And here's the fuller quotation. So we can see Bell wrote, the knowledge we possess exists only in the mind and can only be perceived by its results. But our biblical and pharmaceutical storehouse, which is typical of that knowledge, will be a monument, which while it will afford endless means of instruction, may be considered an heirloom to be handed down to our successors. We can see here that he's describing this ambition to bring together a museum collection with the terms biblical and pharmaceutical storehouse, a monument, an heirloom to be handed down. So this sense of legacy, but the purpose 
is uh, to afford endless means of instruction. So it's intended to be an educational collection. The Museum of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society was therefore founded in 1842, a year after the society itself, and as a reference collection for students of its newly formed School of Pharmacy. William Allen, the society's first president, wrote in his first president's address that the purpose of the museum, alongside the library, lectures and pharmaceutical demonstrations, was to facilitate the acquisition of knowledge by the rising generation. Jacob Bell described the museum soon after it was set up. He wrote, the museum is a front room on the ground floor, 26 feet by 20, containing not a vestige of furniture. The bare boards are well scoured, the ceiling and walls are in a perfect state of repair, but there is not even a chair or table to invite the student to sit down and contemplate what alterations are likely to take place in the apartment within the next six months. On the floor at one corner is a small heap of brown paper parcels containing a few donations from two or three members. And on the mantel shelf are about a dozen glasses and bottles in which are sundry crystals, roots and other substances. These objects form the nucleus of the Museum of Materia Medica of the Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain. By 1858, the Pharmaceutical Journal reported, many of the early supporters of the society vied with each other in presenting the most rare and curious specimens, as well as others varying in quality, to make the collections as complete as possible. In the early days, the museum was primarily used as a source of lecture specimens by the school's professors. And I should say, there was no intention for the museum to focus on historical material or items that reflected the profession's past. It was purely looking at Materia Medica, which of course is the raw materials of medicines, um, predominantly plant-based. And of course, there's a very long tradition of forming it into collections. Um, not time to go into that now, but of course, two people in the room particularly could give us loads of context for this. There's Chris's work on earlier chests and cabinets, of which I guess this museum and in fact the room shown in the picture are examples writ large. And then there's Gemma alongside Rachel, who has recently, well Gemma has recently completed her PhD on the Materia Medica collection here in Manchester, including looking at the wider educational context that these specimens played into the 20th century. The Society's first curator, Theophilus Redwood, shown here, was also the school's first professor of pharmacy. And this set the trend for men, and it was men in charge of the collection, to be experts in pharmacy, or more accurately, pharmacognosy, not historians. Um, and academic pharmaceutical training made them best qualified to collect, research, and interpret the specimens. By 1863, the museum has expanded to occupy three rooms of the Society's headquarters. And after Redwood's retirement in 1867, the Society agreed to a full-time curator post at an annual salary of £150. Three men filled the role between 1867 and 1872. Firstly, James Collins, who, although enthusiastic, was dismissed after just a few months, probably at least partly as a result of an inspection by the Society's Library, Museum and Laboratory Committee that found the museum very dirty. The appointment of Edward Morell Holmes in 1872 was a significant turning point in the museum's history. Holmes, who was born in 1843, died in 1930, uh, was curator for over 50 years until his retirement in 1922, by which time he built up the museum collections to over 20,000 specimens. Obviously, I don't have time to give a full biography today. He had a very long and very successful career. At the society, he was viewed as one of five of the teaching staff in the early days of the school, responsible for teaching Materia Medica. My favourite article that he wrote, clearly fully understanding the students, was guidance on their use of the museum. It was published in 1899, and he pointed out that the prunes, the almonds, the figs, the licorice and other edible specimens were not put out in open drawers like other material, as they are, he wrote, apt to disappear. Students are evidently too familiar with them to need to examine. And it seems, of course, that they were being eaten. In fact, his early frustrations that lecturers and students were taking specimens out of the museum and losing them or eating them um, led him to set up separate teaching and research collections by 1875. So one collection was used to teach students, but the other was the stimulus for current research work. 
with Holmes building up an international network and personally writing more than 600 articles. He published a complete catalogue of the collection in 1878 and continued to encourage donations from around the world, from manufacturers, past students, society members, and from international exhibitions. On receiving the first Flückiger Medal in 1897, he said, the Museum of this Society naturally affords exceptional opportunities of investigating new drugs, since London is preeminently the drug market of the world and opportunities of acquiring and publishing new information are therefore more frequent here. As I said, Holmes had an extremely successful career and just a few highlights. He was the British Pharmaceutical Conference president in 1900. He served as the botanical referee for the GMC and also for the 1912 British Pharmacopoeia. He was a fellow of the Linnaean Society and he was the recipient of the Pharmaceutical Society Hanbury Gold Medal. His particular interest, his particular expertise and the basis of his private collection, which didn't form part of what he looked after at the Pharmaceutical Society, his particular ex expertise was mosses, algae, lichens and shells. And here he is in later life, uh, shown in 1915. A few years later, in January 1921, his leg was crushed by a car when he was crossing the road near his home in Seven Oaks, and he had to have it am amputated, um, which put an end to most of his travel, his botanizing, which he was still carrying out, and attending conferences, which he was still actively um, involved in um, at the age of 79 when this accident happened. Um, it also curtailed his weekly research visits to Kew Gardens, which he'd continued throughout his career. I think in summary, a 1900 article on him um, perhaps sums it up quite nicely. Um, it says, there is no record that his predecessors did much else than keep their place tidy. Mr. Holmes has made his museum as well known as himself. And from youth to the silver haired stage of manhood, he has served succeeding races of students without losing but immensely gaining in infection of those who have sought information from him. A new chapter in the museum's history began in 1937 when the decision was taken by the Pharmaceutical Society to move to a new headquarters. The ambition was raised to establish a historical collection to form part of the new building. Now, the move to the headquarters didn't take place and there's a whole long and complicated tale, um, but the museum collections were expanded as was intended. Agnes Lothian, shown here, was the librarian appointed in 1940. She worked at the Society as a member of staff to 1968, and she was put in charge of establishing these historical collections. But as far as we can tell, she didn't arrive at the Society with any enthusiasm or expertise in historical um, antiques or, or objects. She'd qualified as a pharmaceutical chemist in 1926, having studied at Harriet Watt you know, uh, College. She started in retail, then worked as a rep for a baby food manufacturer and then spent 10 years at Allen and Hanbury. Um, and yes, her, her um, interest in, in history is uh, lost in the mists of time if she had any before she arrived at the society. But she carried out an ambitious purchasing program, particularly in the areas of ceramics, caricatures, proprietary and brand, brand name medicines, and her particular passions were mortars and delftware jars. She did have to work hard to persuade the society to support these acquisitions financially. And she wrote, it was hard work getting even a small budget approved for purchases. What made it harder was that some members of the Council of the Pharmaceutical Society saw no purchase, purpose rather in such expenditure. And I don't think that necessarily has changed. Agnes Lothian's first publication was Drug Jars and Their Inscriptions in the Chemist and Druggist in June 1950, and she wrote many more articles on tin glazed earthenware. But she confessed that writing for publication wasn't easy for her, and she turned down the opportunity to write catalogues of the society's jars and its mortars. Um, personally, just to say it was very pleasing to be able to dedicate the catalogue that I completed of the jars to her many years later, because it was very much built on the foundation she laid. This is just one example of a jar that um, she felt strongly about, um, dated 1672, as you could see, um, and uh, designed to hold oil of spike nard, um, which promoted sweating, um, recommended in the 17th century to treat stomach complaints and flatulence, but also poisoning. And GB may stand for the apothecary George Beercroft. Agnes Lothian bought it in 1954 for the collection from a private collector. 
through her articles, it's clear that one of the things that she was particularly interested in were the different designs, the different design types on delveware jars. And she called this one early songbirds. And you can see the little bird sitting on either end of the cartouche. There are actually only two jars with this design that anyone knows about. So whether stretching it to uh, a design type is a bit far, but as she was the one who was writing about it and had it in her collection, I guess she was perfectly at liberty to describe it. When she died in 1980, Leslie Matthews obituary in the pharmaceutical historian remarked, Nan, as she was known, Nan will long be remembered, not least by every visitor to the pharmaceutical society who appreciates the historical collection there. Many will regard this as her permanent memorial. But if we're going to look at in a little bit more detail about the pharmaceutical ceramics, what made Agnes Lothian consider collecting English Delphware drug jars? Well, in 1908, Henry Walker wrote in The Connoisseur, the collection of old pharmacy jars does not appear to have received the attention of connoisseurs to any appreciable extent. Yet, by 1951, Geoffrey Howard, a pharmacist from a long line of pharmacists remarked, drug jars are fast disappearing from the market. They've become a kind of craze. So what happened in between to change collectors' minds? Well, in 1931, Geoffrey Howard, who was a passionate collector of drug jars himself, published a book on his own personal collection called English Delphware Drug Jars. And in it, he waxed lyrically. He wrote, just as Pepys's diary brings us adorably in touch with the everyday life of our ancestors, so, as we shall see, do these fat, smug, comfortable little vessels with their dates, initials and inscriptions. And I think very much that Howard's book and Geoffrey Howard himself seem to act as a catalyst to raise interest in drug jars. Agnes Lothian was encouraged to join the English ceramic circle shortly after her arrival at the Pharmaceutical Society in 1940. And about the same time, maybe through the ECC, she met Geoffrey Howard. It certainly seems to have marked the beginning of her interest in Delft. And one of the things that she did in order to build up her own knowledge was to visit other collections. In 1943, Sir Sinclair Thompson donated a large collection of jars to the Royal College of Surgeons of England, which Lothian visited. Meanwhile, and there's a Manchester link here, Manchester-based uh, John Wilkinson began collecting and built up a collection ultimately of 600 English drug jars over 40 years, which he donated to the Thackeray Medical Museum in Leeds just before it opened in 1997 and is the largest collection of its kind in the world. So by the time we get to 1951, there's great interest, high auction prices and this kind of craze that Howard describes. What's also interesting, going back to what I said earlier, is that all of these collectors certainly knew each other. Their surviving correspondence tells us that. They helped each other with acquisitions and identifications. They even bid for each other at auctions. As for the Pharmaceutical Society's collection, well, Agnes Lothian wrote in 1960, the nucleus of the Society's collection of English Delft was formed in 1938 when Mr. J.T. Appleton presented to the society three 18th century syrup jars. During the next 20 years, many items were added by both gift and purchase. And these are those three syrup jars that John Thompson Appleton um, donated in 1938. He was a chemist and druggist from Sheffield. Um, it's quite hard to find out much about him, um, but he played an active part in the profession beyond his role as a retail pharmacist. He served as chairman of the Sheffield branch of the Pharmaceutical Society, and he was co-opted onto the Society's Council in 1940. I haven't been able to find anything else about his interest in drug jars. Were these the only three in his collection? Um, we don't know. But we do know a lot about Geoffrey Howard and his passion, not least through his book. He was born into a dynasty of successful pharmacists and played a leading role in the family firm, Howard and Sons. And there are some of the Howards um, top left with Geoffrey on the far left. He also played a wide role in the pharmacy uh, world and he was also clearly a collector. His obituary said his taste was Catholic and embraced without any change of critical standard English Delftware of the 18th century and Matthew Smith's paintings of the 20th. Agnes Lothian went to visit his Delftware collection at the new Howard's of Ilford Limited offices in 1949. Although Howard was clearly addicted to collecting and had managed to track down, down jars from around the country, he wasn't knowledgeable about their inscriptions and he continually called on Agnes Lothian to help him decipher the Latin abbreviations. In 
By June 1950, Lothian had been to visit a number of collections and had collected nearly 300 inscriptions from the jars to help her to understand them. Howard encouraged um, her to build up a personal collection as well as that of the Pharmaceutical Society. In view of their constant correspondence and mutual support, it seems entirely fitting that Agnes Lothian was able to persuade the society to acquire Howard's collection of 65 jars from his three sons on his death in January 1957. By December 1957, the Howard collection was on permanent display at the society's headquarters in Bloomsbury Square. A smaller collection, but still significant, was the 26 jars and one pill tile left of the society by its past president, Ernest Savile Peck, in 1955. Again, an incredibly successful and busy man, but just a brief overview. He began his career as an apprentice to his father's chemist shop in Cambridge and took over the family business in 1904. He was very active in the pharmaceutical world, but also in Cambridge, he served as its mayor and as a founder of the Folk Museum. As for antiques, his first love was actually bell metal mortars, but he also collected Delphware drug jars, buying the core of his collection from another collector, James Pryor in Stanford. Lothian seems to have cultivated his enthusiasm for jars and he, she certainly sent him reading material. Savile Peck was instrumental in helping Lothian acquire one of the most important jars in the society's collection one we've seen a little bit earlier. This large show jar with the coat of arms of the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries on the front and Chinese inspired designs on the reverse is the earliest known English dated Delft drug jar. You can see at the top the date 1647. And it was Peck who put the owner of the jar who was a Reverend Willimott who lived in Somerset in contact with Agnes Lothian in the first place in 1953. And she bought it for the society for a hundred pounds. In 2002, the transfer of Peck's drug jar collection to the society was finally completed when four additional jars, which had originally belonged to Peck, passed to his daughter, were bequeathed by her to the museum. And I travelled with Peter Homan, with Julie Wakefield, um, to St Albans to collect them um, from her house. The society also received a significant collection of Delft jars from this man's widow. So this is John Austin, also of Sheffield, and his widow um, left a collection of jars to the society. Um, they were actually very well-traveled jars. They've been exhibited at the St. Louis exhibition in 1904, and one of the jars still has an American custom sticker on the base. Uh, Austin was another pharmacist, very active in his local community and societies. And finally, as far as collectors go, I just wanted to mention pharmacist collector and BSHP member Henry Everett Broxham, who donated a number of early unlabeled Delphware jars from his large collection of pharmacy antiques. Um, this is an image from the chemist and druggist in 1953 of his pharmacy at 17 Chapel Market in Islington. And you can see, and for a curator, it gives you the heebie-jeebies, um, you can see that he displayed his antiques in and amongst the products he had on sale in his shop. On his death in 1985, the society acquired more than 100 items from this collection, not just Delphware jars, but dispensing equipment, bottles and historical med medicines. However, some of the smaller and earlier examples um, of Delphware in the society's collection were bought and they were bought from archaeological digs. Um, so I'm thinking about this kind of thing, um, but also much smaller ointment pots. Um, tantalizingly, the museum's documentation does not reveal much about their origins or provenance. For example, a record card for the purchase of a group of ointment pots in September 1961 simply reads, an important collection of 34 Lambeth Delft and other early unguent pots recovered from various excavations in London circa 1926. And to fill out and continue the ceramic story, of course there are many other ceramic items in the Pharmaceutical Society's collection, including this rather spectacular Delftware pill tile dated 1670 with the name Thomas Fautrart, um, it's a unique example of the decorated tin glazed earthenware tiles that were found in apothecary shops 
And as many of you will know, there are many examples of ceramics that came into use in the later 18th and 19th centuries. Um, very briefly, what you can see here is a stoneware jar um, on the left hand side, earthenware jars with coloured glazes that really came in in the 19th century. Um, we've then got a creamware syrup jar, so it mimics the shape of Delftware jars, um, but um, Wedgwood developed creamware from the uh, early 1760s. And on the right hand side, a more rare example, a white earthenware jar. Um, this is one of a small set that was commissioned by Corbin and Stacey um, in the early 19th century. So drug jars, definitely, but ceramics in much wider form as well. Um, so we've already seen the uh, ceramic uh, penicillin and culture vessels, top left. Top right, we've got a very fancy bedpan. Bottom right, um, there's a water filter, um, relevant when I was based at 1 Lambeth High Street because it was made by Lambeth Dalton. And bottom left, um, we've got the Dr. Charles Zeno pads um, advertising model. So of course, ceramics used within pharmacy um, in lots of different ways. And the Pharmaceutical Society's drug jar collection has even inspired contemporary ceramicists. So on the left hand side, we've got um, some creamware syrup jars. Um, in the center nestled amongst them is um, a jar that was created by Tamsin Van Essen as part of her medical heirlooms project. And on the right hand side, in a bit more detail, you can see one of those jars. Um, this one was, uh, I think, named psoriasis. Um, she was um, inspired by the forms of the historic vessels and then experimented with different glazes and finishes so that the jars themselves looked as if they were suffering from hereditary diseases. So that's as much as I got time to say this morning about the ceramics collection, but I hope it gives us some ideas about how these things come together and the different factors at play. I wanted to finish by suggesting that pharmacies themselves could be considered as collections. Does that, what, is that what makes pharmacists perhaps good collectors and enables all of this stuff um, to uh, be uh, left um, in museum uh, collections? Although both historically and currently, the majority of items stored on the premises in a pharmacy are intended to be dispensed, so passed on to customers, so they're not permanent fixtures, I'd say we could consider that there are many similarities between the sort of stock control side of what happens in a dispensary and what happens in a museum. Considerations of storage, location, labeling, display, and then communication with the general public all have some kind of common ground. And I've also always said that community pharmacists in particular make fantastic museum workers, Peter Homan being a prime example. All these transferable skills between the two sectors, creating eye-catching displays, conveying pharmaceutical principles to customers or visitors, and also being very careful, being very methodical um, at inventory, at description, and identifying issues surrounding either stock or collection items. So this is a French image, 18th century, an example of what in the museum world we call open storage. It's apothecary's shop's style, um, very distinctive to have rows of ceramic jars on extensive runs of shelving. Of course, that's answering a practical need for significant storage, um, whether that is jars, pots, boxes and barrels. If you look at work done by Patrick Wallace, who analysed um, a large number of probate records for this sort of early apothecary period, he found a significant proportion of the value, the financial value of what was held in apothecary shops was represented by fixtures, equipment, things like these jars. Expenditure on decorative jars was without parallel in any other retail trade at the time. And there's something there, isn't there, about the fact it's a public facing display, but also a storage solution. So you're impressing the customer and perhaps competitors with the sheer range of available products and you're choosing to house them in attractive, fashionable and expensive jars. And of course, the idea of open display continues. Here's the society's first president, William Allen, prominent Quaker businessman, pharmacist, philanthropist, and his career started here at Plough Court, just off Lombard Street in the centre of London. Even though, as we know, the business of Allen and Hanbury's um, moved very squarely into manufacture, they kept this pharmacy a shop. Um, and here's the interior in 1897 as another example of what in a museum world you call open storage. Um, 
but this isn't Delfware jars by the time we get to the 19th century, but shop round bottles. You can see they're all labelled. Um, they are a means of storing the product. Um, I'm sure they all had controlled locations, um, but they're also a display for the customer. And there's another strand here, I think, that starts in apothecary shops of more permanent displays of material never intended for sale. Um, this is perhaps the most famous apothecary, William Shakespeare's apothecary from Romeo and Juliet, first performed in 1597, although this is an 18th century engraving. Um, Shakespeare described his apothecary as being in tattered weeds in a needy shop, stocked with a beggarly account of empty boxes, green earthenware pots, bladders and musty seeds, remnants of pack thread and old cakes of roses. In his words, it's a retailer struggling to make a living, although of course that works for his plot. The apothecary's poor circumstances um, are linked to his willingness to supply poison to the doomed lovers. Well, this engraving um, takes it further. Um, as I say, dating from the mid 18th century, shows an apothecary sorting medicinal herbs in a basket, there's a jar of leeches ready for use on the windowsill, and we've got medicines in jars and drawers behind the counter. But the other thing I wanted to point out was the various creatures hanging from the ceiling. Shakespeare tells us about them. He says that there is a tortoise hung, an alligator stuffed, and other skins of ill-shaped fishes. And I think one of the key factors, again, looking at some of the work Patrick Wallace has done um, to understand about apothecaries, a message they continued to put across was they weren't just shopkeepers. They were and were aspiring to be seen as scientists, even natural philosophers. Um, this amazing trade card shows how one chemist um, with a Y tried to put across his image. This belonged to Daniel Swan on Panton Street in London. And, um, I've blown it up slightly so we can see. Um, you can see that he's got labelled jars on his shelves in the background. Um, obviously, he's sitting there with lots of apparatus um, ready to make medicines um, and to carry out all sorts of scientific experiments. But also at the top of the image, we've got on the left hand side something with a tail hanging from the ceiling. I think we've got a large crab. Um, we've got potentially um, a large elephant skull. Um, possibly um, a turtle as well. So there's this idea of natural history display, perhaps suggesting luxury or mystery, certainly scholarship, um, linked to the growing field of natural philosophy. And Patrick Wallace argues, and I think I'd agree, that an apothecary's reputation was, they were aiming to couple it um, with the idea of informed scientific inquiry as well as the exoticism, the ability to supply medicinal ingredients from around the world. Um, if you look at other sources, the London apothecary Thomas Prescott listed a stuffed alligator in his 1686 inventory, and Thomas Johnson showed the first bananas to reach England, apparently, in his apothecary shop window in the spring of 1633. The idea of display, of course, continues as a thread through many pharmacies, as well as the approach of keeping older material on show alongside current products. So this is an image perhaps well known to many of you um, of Mr. Mello's shop in Enfield. Um, it was taken as a promotional image uh, by the Pharmaceutical Society in 1959. And there he is standing in front amongst his Edwardian fixtures and fittings which actually at the time may well have been under threat. Keeping the fittings might have partly been due to economics. They're well made, they do the job. Again, we're doing um, good storage here. Um, but he's making a decision beyond that, isn't he? He's got the carboys um, very prominently on display. But if you look at the top of the uh, shelving as well, you'll see that there are Delfware jars, an 18th century carboy, a mortar and pestle amongst the modern pre-packaged proprietaries. And there's something here, I think, to be unpacked about pride in a profession with a long tradition, as demonstrated by the displays of historical items. I think it's probably come back to being a bit more fashionable today, but it certainly wasn't in the 1950s, as far as I'm aware. That's a period where these interiors are being stripped out to be replaced by a much more clinical appearance um, with formica, strip lighting, much more minimalism. 
And of course, that's the case in many instances today. This is what you'd expect a pharmacy or the majority of them to look like today, um, certainly um, in community pharmacy. Um, but I'd argue that community pharmacy, but also the wider profession, do hark back to the um, historical objects, um, even if it is in more symbolic form. Um, here we've got the Pharmaceutical Society's headquarters. They're proudly displaying, as well as the museum collections, um, the uh, coat of arms, which dates back um, to the 1840s. And of course, on that arms are various objects that reflect the heritage, the longevity of the activity of making and selling medicine. So we've got the mortar and pestle at the top, um, we've got aloes, we've got an alembic. Um, even if as is the case with the Pharmaceutical Society, their relationship with the history of the profession, their support for heritage activities is perhaps complex. They're very much embracing um, the historical symbolism um, as part of their brand. And that's true also for community pharmacies, even if they don't necessarily have a carboy on display, although many of them do, they choose, and here's an example um, from Leighton Stone, they choose um, to embrace the symbolism that reflects um, these collections. So we've got carboys, we've got a mortar and pestle on the left, we've got the cup of Hygieia on the right, alongside the much later 1984 um, Green Cross. So definitely referencing history and definitely referencing collections, even as it is only with signs and symbols. So in conclusion, I'd reflect that the Royal Pharmaceutical Society Museum and its collections and museum collections relating to pharmacy much more broadly shed interesting light on our collections, collecting and collectors conference theme. Tracing the purpose and composition of museum collections over time tells us about the curator's personal preoccupations, the context within which they and the parent body are operating, as well as in pharmacy's case, the profession that they're collecting to represent. Behind the practice of collecting, there are individual biographies, networks, intentions to explore, whether that's looking at the professional curators or a wider group, such as the close-knit group of Delftware devotees in the mid 20th century, Jacob Bell and Edwin Lance's circle in the mid 19th century, or links between practitioners, artists and curators in more recent years. And in terms of the collectors themselves, I do wonder about the propensity of pharmacists, perhaps community pharmacists in particular, to be collectors, particularly in a profession that has this enormous legacy of three and two dimensional material that was stacked on shelves and in windows for generations. You'll have your own examples. You may have counter examples, but I personally think of Bill Jackson, John Newstead, Terry Turner and Peter Homan as examples of passionate collectors and donors that have ensured that museum collections represent and are a repository for pharmacy's history for future generations. Thank you very much.